Hello, everyone. Hi, you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm very happy to have you all here. Uh, I know we're waiting for a few more people um, to come and jump in, but for right now, since you guys are here, I wanted to get you early access so you could say hi to Jordan. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so you guys, uh, yes, tonight or this evening, I guess we would say this evening, um, technically, but it is, I'm, I'm super, super excited. Uh, Jordan is a winemaker um, from Up in Paso Robles, uh, really, really beautiful wines and also a super awesome, extremely intelligent and talented human being. So this is very exciting to have her here. Uh, as you know, these guys, it's usually very informal, um, these things. Uh, Today, we have a very special treat because we have a gorgeous presentation that Jordan's also put together, including the wines and including a lot of stuff. Um, but I don't want you to hesitate to uh, jump on in and ask questions like normal. Um, how's everyone doing today? Yeah, pretty good? Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Keep it coming. Um, I certainly hope most of you also have the wines because you know, this is really most of the experience. Um, we are starting off with our, this, the white, the 2020, um, the Epic Estates white. And then the second one, just so you know, in case you're lining them up, um, we are gonna do the Veracity second, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we're finishing up with the, the 2017 Estate blend. So if you don't have that open yet, that's totally okay. You'll have time to open them, but I mean, you should probably open them and enjoy them, right? Definitely. <laughs> um, this is good. So people are still kind of trickling in, but um, so anyway, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, well, you know, I, I do, I don't want to take up too much time because I know we only have an hour. So I'm going to go ahead and, and kind of just get it started. And um, mostly what I want to say is thank you so much to Jordan. And um, I have uh, everyone, this is Jordan Fiorentini of Epic Estates. Yay! Hi guys, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Sasha, for having me. Um, thank you guys for all wanting to be here on a beautiful summer day. Hopefully it's beautiful. It's beautiful by us. <laughs> yeah. um, and try our wines or even just hear about our wines because then you can try them at some point. You can come up to Epic or you can go to High Time. We all know he has the wines now, so it's great. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm actually broadcasting from our laboratory um, at our winery. So you can kind of see behind me um, the hills of Paso Robles. And there's actually a vineyard uh, back there as well, which we'll get into. Yeah. So um, I am super excited to start off uh, because I like to hear about, and I know you all do too, about you know Jordan, who she is and where she comes from. And she actually has a really interesting history, uh, a very, very interesting beginning to her wine life. And I would love to uh, let her take it away and kind of share that with you guys about where she started and how she got to Epic. Sure. So I'm actually from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, born and raised. And uh, my father loves wine. He still loves it. He loved it back then. So whenever we were traveling as a family to, um, for vacation, we'd go to wine making regions or whatever vacation we were on, we would find the vineyard near there and he would want to visit. So when I finished, um, and while well, I finished high school, I went to school in New England to a liberal arts school where I studied engineering and art and Italian language. Right. Um, and so when I was getting ready to graduate, I wasn't quite ready to just like make that plunge and yeah, this was 1999. So everyone up there seemed like they were either going to be management consultants or work on Wall Street. And I definitely knew that was not for me. Um, but I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. But my dad at that time, he had been an attorney in Atlanta, and he decided he wanted to switch from being an attorney to planting a vineyard in the North Georgia mountains. Uh, and because of his love of wine. So I thought, well, if you're doing that, you'll be okay with me uh, taking my liberal arts education and going to Napa and working a harvest and trying to figure out what I want to do. And then I'll come back and, you know, get maybe get another degree, who knows? So he said, yeah, sure. Yeah, that sounds great. And so um, I actually went to work my first harvest in Napa in 1999. And then he planted a vineyard and started building a winery and, um, what is the foothills to the Appalachian Mountains in um, North Georgia in a town called Dahlonega, which is actually the site of the first gold rush in the United really? States. Yeah, so I oh guess found gold, they can make wine, right? I mean, I guess, did you find gold while you were making wine? That would no. be really <laughs> You know, that whole like, you definitely wouldn't, yeah. 
<laughs> found the opposite of gold. <laughs> really expensive <laughs> wine grape. So, um, but I found, I mean, needless to say now, I found that with the, the wine industry when I was there, I loved the sort of intersection of art and, wine, and um, science it was kind of what my background was. And I was looking to make a product with my hands. Um, and so I thought, I mean, I would, had only studied in, well, Oh, I got ahead of myself, right? I did the I did the internship in Napa. I actually worked at Markham at the okay. heyday of Merlot before the Sideways movie came out. And then I decided instead of going back to the East Coast, I was going to apply and hopefully get into UC Davis for their Masters of Viticulture and Enology. And I did, and mm -hmm. just kept like you know pursuing what I thought was the dream of you know being a winemaker and finding this intersection of art and science which again, the UC Davis side definitely pushed the science side, which I feel like you need to do the science first and then you can expand off of that. Um, when I was at Davis, I also knew I wanted to go there because they offered an internship to one student every year in Italy at Antonori. So mm -hmm. when I became a student, I got that internship. So I spent the harvest of 2002 yeah. at Antonori and I met my husband when I was over there too. So. That and was he, so he's Italian. He's Italian. So. Like he and he actually is in the wine industry now. Uh, if any of you guys visit Paso, he has a warehouse in downtown Paso. He imports um, Italian winemaking equipment um, and tanks and you know filters and all sorts of crush equipment. And then he also works for two cooperages in France. Um, oh my goodness. That he's so he's the rep for these two Cooper. They're connected. They're they're owned by the same family. Yeah. And um, he has a mobile wine treatment company in Paso Robles. Oh my gosh, that's like seven jobs. Yeah, he <laughs> he is a man. Yeah, of many trades, and like he does. Yeah, but he has a full on Italian accent. And do you guys speak Italian at home? Because we do. Italian. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Definitely. Um, oh, this is great. What does a wine treatment company do? Oh, so he, so he was, he reps this, this, it's probably the most advanced technologically um, company for, that produces filters for wine, crush equipment, presses, you name it. And so he, since he was re representing them um, in this area, he also does British Columbia and Oregon and Washington. Um, I think he just got bored at one of the wine shows he was at years yeah. ago and decided to sell himself a filter. And so then, yeah, so they, he has the filters that are cross flows that basically take wine from, you know, being unfiltered to being sterile filtered in one pass. That's a, what a cross flow does. He also has reverse osmosis machines where people, um, you pretty much use that if you have an issue with your wine, if the volatile acidity is too high, there's a yeah. few other things it can, it can do. So he started that company as well. So it's sort of like connected to his import. So when you guys met, obviously you were still studying at UC Davis and then you went to like when you graduated with your master's, which is really impressive. Congratulations. <laughs> <What'd> you <do? laughs> I don't have that much focus and concentration anymore. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <Anyone? laughs> um, yeah, we, so we were, we had started see, you know, dating and we knew we wanted to be together. And um, we actually went back and worked with my dad in Georgia for a few years because him being Italian, we knew that he had a place to work and yeah. same with me. And so we went with my dad and kind of got the winery and vineyard, more the winery and the wine sales started. And then at a certain point, we wanted to both move to California mm -hmm. um, to sort of spread our wings and see what we could do. And so then we came to California in 2007. And that's when I got the job at Chalk Hill Estate in Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. And then he works for actually an Italian or yeah, an Italian equipment importer in uh, Windsor at that point. And okay. then, um, so we loved it there, but I, and I was hired as the associate winemaker at uh, Chalk Hill and then eventually the winemaker left and I became the head winemaker. And, uh, but then it looked like the winery was gonna sell to a much larger corporation. Mm -hmm. And I knew I didn't wanna be a corporate winemaker. Mm -hmm. um, or I just like didn't think I had because obviously lots of friends in the wine industry and talked around and so I was sort of thinking I needed to get my act together and figure out what I wanted to do and on a whim I talked to somebody about this job and past the rebels and just thought well okay it's just time for me to just see what's out there yeah and what was out there ended up being sort of like the rest of my <laughs> wine life which and here we are. 
moving to Paso and uh, I met Bill and Liz Armstrong in our main vineyard, which at then was very young, which is our Pederewski vineyard in uh, 2010 and fell in love with uh, the possibility of this project and where it could go. Uh, and, you know, Paso since then has just sort of taken off and yeah. You know, uh, from the uh, thing like you yeah. see a big change since 2000 especially the last year it's really like, yeah oh, it's crazy it's like Paso just all of a sudden became the place to be <laughs> which is awesome <laughs> it's like I feel like it just happened like that and we're all like what happened <laughs> But um, very grateful, and uh, when we show, I'll show you a bunch of pictures, so it'll like yes. make the whole all petter, our vineyards and the winery and everything come to life um, through the pictures, which is the most exciting part. So yes, let's let's definitely do that and get that started. Okay, that okay be- perfect. Well, and as Sasha said, hopefully everyone's already drinking. If you have the wines, so like yeah. to turn on the white and just make sure everyone gets into it because um, we'll move. I'll move forward through the different wines. And if you don't have them, maybe it'll spark some interest on the ones you want to try. Um, so can everyone see that? Does that look good? It looks amazing. Okay, perfect. Oh, I'm not at the beginning. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> sorry. Okay, here we go. Uh, Africa State Wines is the uh, winery and vineyard that at where I uh, make the wine and um, where I am today. And uh, we're 100% estate grown. So that means we don't buy fruit from any of their vineyard properties. We grow everything that we produce. Um, and we can get into the farming in a second. But since hopefully some of you have the white, I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of uh, what's in that wine and talk about it for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, it's in this really fun bottle. Um, it's a Rhone white because at Epic we make, we're pretty much all Rhone varieties. Uh, we have Tempranillo and Zinfandel as well, but other than that, it's all Rhones. Some are single varietal, some are blends. Um, this white is a Rhone white. It takes inspiration from the Southern Rhone. So it's a Grenache Blanc, um, a Viognier and Roussan blend. In the Southern Rhone, you'll find even more whites than this. I wish we could find more whites through our nurseries, um, but these are the main ones that we have planted here. Uh, Grenache Blanc based because Grenache, we wanted to keep the wine really fresh and mineral driven. And uh, Grenache Blanc is the variety to do that with. And Grenache Blanc, if some of you aren't familiar with it, it really just looks just like Grenache, except for it's white. Uh, <laughs> acts just like Grenache, but it's, so it's Grenache Noir and Grenache Blanc. And so the, it, it looks exactly the same. It has a lot of same characteristics in terms of the, um, the morphology of the, the clusters and then how thick the skins are and just even flavors between yeah, yeah and kind of puffiness, right you kind of always get a little bit of that still in the finish which i think is fun and always super kind of refreshing and in that extra element exactly like grenache um resides in that sort of front to mid palate uh wine and also uh, lower ph um uh, yes so that kind of like nice brightness the, really um, fresh. the um so these were uh was the grenache and were all these planted when you first got there and did the cuttings come from topless creek <laughs> Yeah, some of them, definitely. So when I came, um, two of our three vineyards had some plantings on them, and then we've expanded that or replanted. Um, so the Grenache Blanc was actually, is mostly at our Catapult vineyard. Uh, the Viognier is at our Catapult and Paderewski vineyard, and then the Roussan is at our Catapult vineyard. So most of the whites come from our Catapult vineyard, which I'll get, that's the second vineyard we planted. Uh, but yeah, we had a lot of cuttings from Tablas Creek. We also had a lot of... Uh, um, other cuttings that were from France, but it had been propagated um, through a nursery in the United States. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have to look to France because we're using the own varieties. Yeah. So um, also these are so I know um, we're gonna talk about these later too. But uh, these your your tasting note sheets are incredible. So if you ever go tasting there, they have these sheets, and we'll see more of them later. But um, like, look how beautiful this is, you guys! Like all this information that you could possibly need and want is just given to you. And I did this thing where I kind of wanted to make it look like it was on like, you know, this was years ago I started, but it's like all it's like stats are on there as if it was like a person on a dating app. Like, yes. And if you're like, you do that too. I love it. You're like my personality. <laughs> exactly. This is who I am. Um, 
And the cool thing I think about the Grenache Blanc specifically is it ferments and ages in concrete mm -hmm. uh, to help highlight the minerality and keep the wine really fresh. So we use co a combination of concrete um, barrels, and then we have one um, oak fudra, which is an oak cask, which we also use for this wine. So it's kind of got not only the different varieties, but also different fermentation and aging vessels. Yeah, and so um, is it the concrete are eggs? Are all of them or is uh, that they're eggs and tulips? I have pictures of them when we look at the winery in a few minutes. You'll see um, the different sizes we have because I kind of have a concrete obsession. So I use it for red and white, which we'll talk about. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I'll move on to the next um, slide. So most of you guys know because you're probably in California, but um, we are located uh, equidistant between LA and San Francisco. Um, really close to the coast. So it's about three hours from both uh, places. And more specifically, um, here's a map of the 11 sub AVAs of Paso Robles. Uh, back in 2013, a bunch of winemakers and winery owners and vineyard managers have been working on uh, getting the area subdivided because it was, I think, the largest AVA before that. And there was yeah. no delineation. People yeah. used the 101 is the delineation between the west and the east side of Paso, but other than that, there was nothing. So there's lots of study that went into it, soil types, microclimates, um, and came out with 11 sub AVAs. And so we're still, I think cust customers and wine writers, the wine aficionados are still trying to understand the nuances of the wines from the different regions because we didn't label under those until 2013. Yeah, yeah, in 2013, that's really, and even then I think it wasn't, I don't think I heard about it kind of until much later. I mean, just, I, I don't know that it was really kind of put out there to a lot of people either in terms of the same way that Napa is. But. Right, so that's like, I mean, it took probably a few years for people to start yeah. even putting it on a label. So for us, our wines from West Paso reside in the Willow Creek district which you can see is the pink district. It's kind of almost the further, one of the furthest west districts. And then we also have our winery, another vineyard in our tasting room on York Mountain. But York Mountain is a separate AVA. Mm -hmm. So it's not included in the 11, but luckily we're on this map too. So we can talk about oh, yeah, it. That's right, it's not, is it? Why is no. that? Um, it's really different here. Um, okay. It is super close to the coast. Uh, we're very mountainous and we have different soil type and lot very different climate okay. uh, we're about 15 to 20 degrees cooler than paso on any summer day like today high was 85 and it was almost 100 at our Pederewski vineyard um, so i'll get into that more when we look at more pictures as well i uh, just wanted to show you bill and liz armstrong who are the owners of epic they're geologists they met in geology 101 their freshman year in college and been together ever since um, so they fell in love with the rocks um, in Paso Robles, more specifically at the Paderewski Vineyard on the west side of Paso. Uh, we're mostly limestone containing here, which is very unusual for a new world wine region. It's very sought after in the old world, but not um, hard to find in the new world. So that's really what they fell in love with. And then the town of Paso and the people. Yeah. Uh, here's a shot of the Paderewski Vineyard at sunset, um, just to yeah, give a little bit of an overview. Um, and then why do we call it Paderewski? I don't know if any of you are familiar with Ignacy Paderewski, but he was a famous Polish pianist, a composer, a performer, and he became um, a politician too. He was the fir first prime minister of free Poland. But in the early 1900s, he traveled around the United States in um, train and performed. We didn't have TV and uh, movies back then, so people, traveled far and wide to go see him and his concerts. Um, and he traveled all around the United States, but he was probably traveling between concerts in LA and San Francisco and he had really bad arthritis. So his doctor recommended that he stop in Paso Robles mm -hmm. and soak in the mineral hot springs that were rampant in this area. Now there's less after several earthquakes, but there were a lot more back then. And he came here and he fell in love with it. And he was a very forward thinking man. He wanted property. So he bought land on the west side of Paso and planted orchards and grapevines with the intent with the grapes of making wine. Oh. So when we purchased the Paderewski property in 2004, um, we found this barn full of his old picking boxes. He actually, no one burnt them for basically over a hundred years and um, they're still there today. So, um, 
he, we have a bunch of exchanges between him and some professors at UC Berkeley, which was the ag school back then before it got moved to UC Davis. Wow. Yeah, and about asking what grape varieties he should plant. And they recommended Petite Syrah and Zinfandel. So really? that's why he planted it. So that's why we planted it as an homage to him. And I left out the most important part was like the heart of the property that he owned and planted grapes on is what we years later purchased and now named the Paderewski Vineyard after him. So here's a little picture of Rancho San Ignacio. He turned his name Spanish and planted grapes in California. And um, to tie the history together. So we, when I came here, we had our Paderewski Vineyard had been planted in 2004 partially. And we had also planted our Catapult Vineyard in 2008. We were making our wine at a winery called Denner Vineyards, which is some of you guys might be familiar with, which is off Vineyard Drive. It's a very great place. Um, it was amazing. I got to meet all the winemakers that were making wine there, which there were many back in 2010. And it was a great introduction for me to Paso. We rented space there and made wine for seven vintages. And at a certain point we needed a home for Epic. And around that time, the old York Mountain Winery and property um, was uh, up, it was owned by the bank. And so the Armstrongs were able to, able to purchase York Mountain, um, the historic winery, which had been the oldest bonded winery in the county. They purchased that in 2010. And we decided that we would uh, eventually build our winery here and turn the old winery into our tasting room. Um, but to tie it to Paderewski, Paderewski actually had hired the York brothers in the early 1900s to make his wine. So he grew his grapes at the Paderewski Vineyard and then brought them to York Mountain to be turned into wine. So we've kind of put the history of Paso back together with the two properties. Yeah. And um, on the left, you see the old York Mountain Winery, what it used to look like. And on the right um, is the updated version. We used all the old materials, kept them in the same location and the same square footage, but turned the entire facility into the tasting room and mm -hmm. event center versus like the first room, which is now the courtyard was the tasting room and the rest of the facility was the winery before. Oh, wow. No, it's 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 really stunning. And I think, when did it open uh, to the public? Um, we finished this in 2000, gosh, I can't even remember, 17? Yeah, pre recently though. Yeah, pre, yeah. So it was late, it was founded in 1882. Uh -huh. uh, it was operational for a very long time. It changed hands probably in the 50s and then um, changed hands again in the early 2000s. And then in 2003, where there was the San Simeon earthquake. So it was condemned. The San Simeon fault line runs right through here because we're actually, as you saw on the map, really close to the coast in Hearst Castle. Um, so yeah. the fault line goes right through Hearst Castle and then comes through York Mountain. And at that point, the property became um, condemned and then that's how we were able to purchase it in 2010. So we have the same, if you come visit us, we have the same press that was used um, in, the, in the winery, basically in the same location. They use gravity flow. So it's up on top of the, of the building. It's and really cool. You sort of see the, the tasty room there. It's kind of a fun visual. Um, yeah, and that room in the back that's kind of like the barrel room with the rock, yeah. is that kind of um, the sides of those, are those the rocks like the limestone or? Oh, uh, those are actually the sandstone. So in a minute, I'll show you the pictures from the different vineyards, but the vineyard here is all sandstone. And that's another reason why it's its own AVA, because it's not limestone, not shale. Um, yeah. But though they use the rocks from the property to build the original barrel cellar, which is in that room. And then they also hand fired all the bricks on the property. So they're, um, the bricks are made out of the, the soil from here as well. That's amazing. And then there's a picture of the, just the front of the tasting room. Um, so I think now I'll just move on to one of the red, the first red, which is the veracity. And also I hope everyone has enjoyed the white. If you, I mean, just like all of the beautiful everything, um, but now it's, yeah, definitely get into. <laughs> to the red. So the reds are kind of the core of our, of our um, production, but we have a white and we actually have a rosé, which is really fun too. Um, if you guys are into dry provincial style rosé. Um, this is probably one of my favorite bottlings. I tend to <laughs> showcase this one a lot just because I love it. Um, but it's a 2017 Veracity. Um, most of our wines have our, our fanciful names that end, or words that end in I-T-Y. And that was because 
they are all character traits we feel that Paderewski exhibited in his life. So veracity is a great word. Um, and this is a Movedra Grenache heavy GSM. So it's kind of the mid palette wine. If it was Syrah based, it would be heavier. Try to have Syrah just play like a little part in this wine, not a huge, yeah. not a huge role. Both of our vineyards are featured in this wine at different percentages, depending on the year. Um, yeah. Both of our vineyards, I should say in the Willow Creek district. So um, yeah, this is a very like, yeah, so exactly. it's a very blend. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually age a portion of this wine in concrete and in barrel. Okay. How much of your um, barrel like program is new versus uh, first year versus second year? Well, it like depends that? on the wine. I try to be really um, over the, I mean, I've taken a long time working with these wines to get their personalities to mm -hmm. be where I want them. So like, despite, I love the difference in the vintages, but the personality of the wine should always be the same. Yeah. So um, this one just has a very small amount of new. It has 26%. Um, and when I say new, it's all French, but they're mid-size and large barrels. So I'm not using small barrels on this mm -hmm. wine. So the oak impact is actually less. Yeah. The wines remain really fresh, especially with the aging in concrete. You can see 36% of this wine was aged in concrete and the rest was in um, different size barrels, um, but mostly neutral. Did you buy them from your husband? Some of them. <laughs> Not all of them. We have very like lively conversations yeah, about. I'm sure. I'm sure it's very opinionated. Yeah. It's very yes. Um, we actually did a we did a Zoom with him and I and our local like radio um, yeah. personality Adam Montiel, who's super into wine. He has his own podcast. Uh -huh. And Manu, I was my husband. It was amazing. I never heard him talk about his vessels on. <laughs> so it was great. Not at the dinner table. It was yeah. awesome. <laughs> um, right. So this is my, the, the, the tasting notes like you saw before, I do a little bio of the wine and then all the info on it, like when it was picked and pH yeah. and all those kind of nerdy things. But then on the reds, I do this other thing where I draw them, I draw the texture of their palette as I perceive it. Um, and this is something that is just something I do, but I've done it for all of our wines upon release. And it's a, it's how I kind of show the science and the art that to me is wine um, in a picture form. So I basically, um, Sasha wanted me to show these. I did, you guys, I think these are some of the coolest things, right? Cause it's, it's, it's so hard to conceptualize wine. And I think putting a visual to it, cause I love art too. And it's, these are beautiful and they're so expressive. And I wanted you to, I wanted to hear about how they come to be. So you all. I know it's kind of one of those things that it's also taken a while, but it's how I think about wine. So I actually, when I was at Chalk Hill, we made Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, which were fabulous, but we were also making Bordeaux blends, but in a slightly cooler appellation than Napa. And so we were always trying to chase Napa in terms of texture and fullness and richness for the, the Bordeaux wines we were making. So I was very texturally based. I grew up that way. I was reared that way as a winemaker. Um, and it's always been my belief that if you do everything correct in the vineyard and the wine winery, then you can, you don't change the aromas or the flavors, like what you're going after is the texture of the wine. Um, and these textures really, important to me, but really hard to describe in words, right? Yeah. That's how it feels. So I do these drawings um, that are basically on a four part quadrant. So it's as the wine enters my mouth from the, it goes from the left to the right. And the top left quadrant is the top front of my palate. Bottom left is the bottom front and so on and so forth. And as the wine travels from the front to the back or the left to the right, wines usually fold back over on themselves. The tannin set in, sets in at a certain point. And so that's what this is depicting. Like, where's the richness? Where's the texture? Um, how does it feel as it moves across the palette? This is so great. So I'm, I'm like looking at, do you, are these actually defined of like fruit versus tannin or just more of a whole cohesion of expression? It's a whole cohesion. I would say that like fruit and other flavors, like, you know, whether you have meatiness, gaminess, herbaceousness. Like I think the volume of the wine is depicted here and the tannin, but not, it's hard to, you know, those flavors are what I write about, yeah. but I don't, yeah. Like I said, those are just coming from the vineyard uh, for the most part. I'm trying not to get in the way of that you, by using either too much oak or having too ripe of wine or too much volatile acidity or whatever it is. I'm trying not to get in the way of the vineyard. Yeah. When I make these wines. 
Yeah, no, it's like, it's, it's so you're creating this beautiful image to kind of, um, of the shape of the wine in your mouth, basically. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. It's, it's so cool. And they're, really fun. they're fun in series. So like when you have a lot of them up, I have them hanging on my wall in my office, but uh, it's just like something to track every year and get you thinking about wine differently. Um, yeah. I mean, it must also be fun to like, yeah, see them as an evolution, like the past, the, the, Mm -hmm. the past like 10 <laughs> veracities that you've done definitely have. like they have similarities but then some years are richer and riper like uh, 17 was a pretty warm vintage yeah um, but I date yeah. them when I do them because obviously wine is evolving and changing over time and textures changing um yeah no, lot, so great. you know oh, yeah so this is you tasted this in winter 2020 do you have one of these from an earlier or was that the first been fresh well, I do all the wines upon release uh, but I have gone back and like retasted and drawn to see if there's a similar impression. And usually there is, which is really cool. Um, Cause then I feel like I've, I'm being consistent. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I think this shows like it was a very full vintage. There's still, um, you know, lots of richness, uh, but uh, like kind of like an upward, this happens in, a, I, I want in a lot of our wines to have a lot of energy and a lot of upward um motion in the palate because flabby would be like flat you know not good acidity and not good freshness and um it's not super tannic because it's it's a mid palate wine but the tannin does kind of like dot the top of the palate um, no i think this is i just think this is exceptional and super fun and so like everyone i hope everyone is like tasting over and over be like do i like how do i associate with this am i getting this image in my mind right because it's just a great way to expand your, your, the way you look at wine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you some vineyard pictures now because they're mm -hmm. vineyard pictures. Um, so we, these are three properties, Paderewski, Catapult, York Mountain, mm -hmm. all drone images. Um, my husband took these pictures because he's obsessed with equipment, oh. as you know, and he <laughs> loves drone too. Um, so <laughs> this is the Paderewski vineyard. It's me walking on the near the Viognier slope, and then we're looking out. Um, this is it's kind of hard to see it here, but the property kind of opens up, and we always talk about the Templeton Gap when we talk about West Paso and the cooling breezes that filter in through the Santa Lucia mountain range to get to the vineyards, and that you can kind of see the mountain range there. Yeah, it's it's facing south here, so to the right is the is the west coast. Got it. And then a um, little picture of the soils and why we all fell so in love with Paso. Um, as winemakers and winery owners and grape growers, we always want to grow grapes and make wine that really reflects where it's from. And in Paso, um, I, the intense climate and the intense soils really leave an impact on the wines, where I think regardless of what the variety or what the blend is, you can a lot of the times you can taste that it's from Paso. Um, but this is a picture of some of our um, limestone and shale soils uh, mixed together and how they're vertically and horizontally fractured. Um, and then an oak tree growing on top of this intense rock. And you can see that the roots will go and penetrate into the soil in search of moisture, uh, water, and nutrients. And so that's what we hope to encourage uh, in the vines as well through our yeah. farming practices. And we are uh, mostly biodynamically farmed. We use all biodynamic principles. Really? Yeah. And we're not certified, but we follow the biodynamic farming principles because we are looking to uh, focus health soil on soil health more than anything. So this is a picture of um, the limestone and the topsoil at Paderewski. So you can see it's all white. It's very, we call it limestone, mm -hmm. calcareous, high pH. Um, and the pH of the soil there is above eight. So it's oh, wow. really for the wines to grow in. And there's the old adage in the old world that the higher the pH of your soil, the lower the pH of your wine, okay. which I do think is true. Um, but there's other things at play as well, of course. Of course. Um, really quick, so for the biodynamic, did you bring and introduce the biodynamic farming? Was it something that was already being used or? I did because I moved here in 2010 and um, it was just me. And yeah. we were using a vineyard management company and I really wanted to, I knew I didn't have the, all the answers or even some of the answers for the farming, but I knew what I, I knew goals that I had. And I felt that through introducing biodynamic farming, we could become more dry farmed, if you will, because a lot of 
pasta is easier to dry farm because of the fractured nature of the soil. And so I wanted to explore that to create more expression of the terroir in the wines. Um, and mostly because our catapult vineyard, which I think we'll get to next, here we go, um, was extremely uh, desolate. It was like the desert vineyard when I got here. And I, it was like a moonscape and I just didn't, I couldn't come up with my own principles. I needed help. And so that's when we brought in biodynamics that has such a focus on the soil health. And um, even after the first year, people, this vineyard is very visible. Um, it's right off the 46 West. And people were like, what did you do to that vineyard? It looks amazing. And it just <laughs> was alive again. And, you know, Paderewski has always kind of been in its groove and it, it was fine, but I wanted to switch it there too from conventional farming to biodynamics. And so anyway, we do it everywhere now. That's amazing. That's really cool. How long did it take to make that transition roughly? Um, it took like two to three years to really get it dialed in. Um, and then it just depends, like you can scale biodynamics. Um, we have the three vineyards that we're doing it on. So it depends if you want to grow up, if you want to grow up all your own compost, it would be really difficult, but we used to grow some of the compost and then buy some of the compost. Mm -hmm. So we find the organic compost that we want. And that's what we still do today. We, yeah. you know, we do the best we can to do all the compost in house, but when we can't, we'll purchase organic compost. You add certain preparations to it. Yeah. Um, for me, it's always been like, why not? Right. If these are the preparations we need to add, we're just going to add them. And, um, like I said, we have a biodynamic consultant and he lives and breathes biodynamics, which I think if you're a consultant, you should be dogmatic and into what you're consulting for. So yep. he's really helpful when we're having some kind of nutrient issues um, in, in the vineyard. I get this would not be an easy thing to do in a more uh, humid environment like Georgia, but California is so arid and dry that you have this opportunity. Why not take it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really cool. So this is catapult. Beautiful. And catapult is also soils of? Uh, interestingly, they're all shale here. Um, it's it's shale, the Monterey shale and the limestone are weaving in and out throughout West Paso, especially the Willow Creek district. Um, and so it just happens, this is two complete hillsides and they're almost all shale. And the, so the pH um, is like high fives here. Uh, which would make you think that it was an easier site to farm, but it's actually much more difficult. It's extremely windswept in the shale soils where the limestone, limestone and shale are both vertically and horizontally fractured and they were all ancient seabeds at one time. Um, the shale is very well drained, so it has no water holding capacity. So it's like, it's like a colander. You put water in and it just goes away. So that makes that and the wind here really drying. Um, Mm -hmm. Sea winds make it a pretty difficult and intense um, farming site. So these are the grapes. I'm sorry, which grapes are in catapult for the most part? Um, so catapult has like almost all the same grapes as Paderewski. We didn't okay. plant Petit Syrah or Zinfandel there because that, those were the varieties that we put in uh, specifically for Paderewski at the Paderewski Vineyard. Um, we do grow Tempranillo there, so we have the, all the same rounds and then Tempranillo. Awesome. That's that one. And then the York Mountain Vineyard is our newest addition. So when we purchased the property in 2010, uh, there was a historic vineyard here that no longer existed because they didn't deer fence back in the early 1900s to the mid 1900s. So we came in and put deer fencing and replanted just like the Paderewski Vineyard replanted the vineyard that had once been there, which is really lovely because we didn't have to read, we had to develop it, but we didn't have to like, we're not looking at like forested areas that then we want to make into a vineyard though. No, they were open yeah. lands that we, same with the catapult vineyard, the catapult vineyard actually had been like farmed to cattle. That's also why it was in pretty rough shape when we planted <laughs> the needing biodynamics. But um, we said so we came in and replanted this vineyard, which is like, you know, I talked about the Santa Lucia range and how the air filters through there to get to West Paso while the York Mountain Vineyard is in the Santa Lucia mountains. Okay. So, um, it's a lot foggier, it's a lot cooler, um, and it has totally different soils. It's got um, sandstone mm -hmm. soils. Um, so these have a pH of the high fours. So we're dealing with all these different, um, it keeps my vineyard manager completely on his toes because they're all having, they're different issues with all the different vineyards. Yeah. Um, and here we have planted Syrah, Grenache, and Viognier a little bit of Zinfandel and a little bit of Cabernet, actually. Um, 
but the idea was to do these really pure expressions of the three Rhone varieties. Um, it's really fun if you come to Epic. When we're pouring the York Mountain wines in the tasting room, you can compare and contrast to the West Paso. So it's always fun to do like a, you know, the same, same variety, different vineyard. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it, it's, it's amazing how different they can be. And so having that experience, it is really cool and sort of um, being able to have that side by side. Uh, it's just really incredible because soil and, and climate and all of that together and how it affects the individual grapes. And obviously are, you're probably using different clones in each one too. We are, yeah. And I think it's more of like over the years and trying, I always am trying new ones when we plant something new, but also trying to figure out what we think um, deals with this and climate the best and express yeah. the site the best. Same with the rootstock. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a few unrooted uh, vines, especially Pederewski, just the Pederewski vineyard because it's kind of isolated. Um, York Mountain had actually had phylloxera mm -hmm. back in the day, so we knew we had to use grafted rootstock here. Um, but yeah, we we usually mostly mostly grafted, and then also figuring out the rootstocks that work for the different sites. Um, because that, again, like that's so relevant to the soil type, so it's all part of that too. Yes. Yeah. Like, are you um, limestone yeah. tolerant? Are you not? drought tolerant or you not, those kind of things. And drought tolerant, so um, question here about the future. Um, so how much of a concern is the future of water availability to you and other winemakers in Paso? And, you know, is it is it a big concern or is it kind of a hype or what's your opinion? It's a huge concern every day. Every, every day there's a big concern. So, I mean, I think the only, how do I say this? The only good thing about it is that I think it keeps like people from developing the whole area because there's just not enough water. Um, but it's okay. scary. And especially in a year like this year where we didn't get a lot of rainfall. Yeah. Um, we need to, you know, we're not on an aquifer or the main aquifer, like the east side of Paso basically. Um, it's like Santa Barbara County where if you drill for a well at a certain point, you drill really deep and then you hit all this water. Um, so they're all pulling off the same aquifer. The west side has all different little aquifers and springs and those type of things. So you really don't know where you're going to find it. You have to really study the geology and then hope and pray that you hit water. Um, and as the, you know, the drought is happening and more people have vineyards and just the changes that are happening, um, it's harder and harder to pump water and find it. So it's a huge concern. That's why having dry farmed vineyards is definitely um, a priority a priority and York Mountain our intention was to be I mean our always our intention is to use the little the least amount of water we possibly can but at York we weren't we put irrigation in because we had a well but it turns out that well didn't perform as well doesn't perform as well as we had hoped and we have other things that need the water more and so we just had to sort of dry farm by default at York and we've been luckily it gets it gets a lot more annual rainfall it can get twice to three times the amount of the east side of Paso, wow. but it doesn't have a lot of groundwater that we can find. So that combined with the cooler temperatures and the lime or the sandstone soils are even more sort of like hydrating in a way than the limestone. They retain some natural moisture that helps us to dry farm here more. Yeah. Um, and, and out of curiosity, just I know you don't know all of there's way too many winemakers and, and, and wine grow and grape growers in Paso, but is there sort of a general understanding of that? Like, do you feel like more people are going oh, to yeah. dry farming? I definitely think so. I mean, especially we never was trying to, there's a limited amount of water and we're trying to figure out how to use it. And um, everybody's kind of on board with that. They're like, hey, yeah, I mean, it's like, I, yeah, it's a different have people, different people have different farming practices, but uh, for the most part. I would say there's, especially on the west side, because there's like different farming practices and also different water availability. And yeah. on the east side, you, we have water, but it's running lower. So there's a concern oh. there. But on the east, on the west side, it's like my well might not perform forever. Yeah. So what are my options? And so we're constantly thinking about it. Yeah. All the time. Um, yeah, it's scary. Um, but on that note, we'll move to the okay. state, which is our. Um, that's the third wine for tonight. Yeah. And it is our sort of main production red at Epic. It is echoes the sort of acreage we have planted to red varieties. And I call it the snapshot of Epic's farming practices and winemaking practices in a certain vintage. So this is sort of like Epic in a bottle every year. Yeah. Uh, we have the most acreage planted to Syrah. Um, and so Syrah is always the leading grape. It's usually more than 36%, but in 17, it was 36%. 
Grenache, Mavad are kind of neck and neck, and we always have Tempranillo in this wine, which is kind of fun and adds structure to the Rhones, which are, can be, you know, pretty juicy and um, full. And then we have a little Zin and a little Carignan too. So it has everything. It has our concrete tanks, our stainless steel tanks, um, yeah. our punch and ferments. And I'll show you the pictures of the winery in a second. Yeah. The other thing that's cool is when you go plant a vineyard, mm -hmm. you have, especially here, we have rolling hills, right? With different exposures to the sun and different soils. So you match the variety in the rootstock to the soil and the exposure and even the trellis system. Like if you do head trained or you don't mm -hmm. do head trained in the vineyard, you match all of that depending on like what you have from mother nature. And so this wine really shows that sort of patchwork um, art, if you will, or science that's in the vineyard, but it shows it in the bottle. Cause all those decisions we made are like all right here. That's really cool. Do you have um, multiple training types that you use? We do, we do, uh, we have, Traditionally, what was planted initially was the VSP, the vertical shoot position, where it's like, you know, you train the vine up, you go on the wire, and then the shoots grow up. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're uh, shoot uh, spur pruned. So we just cut off, you know, the spurs to two yeah. spurs every year, and then it grows. But we, do, we did start to do more cane pruning on Syrah on the VSP, which is where you take um, the new growth every year and you lay it down. Mm -hmm. It becomes your um, fruiting wood. Because um, Syrah is not extremely fruitful, um, especially as it gets older. And um, more recently, we started doing more head trained vines where you have, the, you know, it's more of like the bush vine style, but it's modernized because yeah. it's trained. You have to, the vine wants you to control it a little bit or it will go crazy. Um, <laughs> so so you, <laughs> you had to replant. So like when you, as you planted new things, you would just do different trainings as they, as they. We either replanted or we actually had a lot more property on the Paderewski vineyard. We still do to plant. Um, so it's just kind of like a piecemeal thing as we learn and you know uh we also changed uh we do a lot of seven we have seven foot rows by three foot spacing in vines okay the initial planting and then some seven by five but when we went and planted new stuff we did larger spacing we stuck to the seven by five for water reasons for did water it, reasons. yeah we did yeah. it yeah there's less vines per acre so less to irrigate do you guys do um, any mechanical harvesting or do you do all hand? We know. It's uh, very hilly here. I think like a mechanical would be difficult. It would be possible, but not, I am, I, I'm not, you know, I don't bash it because I think it's an amazing technology, but the cleanliness, uh, the perfection of the fruit that we're looking for doesn't match up yet to what, um, it would probably be fine for a grape like Syrah. Syrah grapes do stem so well. They fall off the vine when you go on the, on the sorting table, but other varieties are more difficult. And then we also do a lot of whole cluster. So like mechanical harvesting basically takes the vine, shakes it and the grapes fall. Yeah. So it doesn't work for whole cluster. And then also here uh, with these different varieties, um, like Grenache for instance, is just, it's very attached to the, to the rachis. It doesn't fall off like Syrah does. Um, it doesn't, it just, it's just different. I don't want to pick it so ripe that it's falling off the vine because then the alcohol, or the alcohol would be high and then the wine might taste like port. So, uh, or bagnoles to be more correct, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I try not to pick it right either. So um, this one I have a drawing too for, here it yeah. is. Yes, let's all taste to the drawing. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Um, this one's a very full palette wine because it's Syrah based, but again, it's got a lot of texture. 17 again, warm year, so um, very full palette. Um, but in the ascension as well, great acidity and minerality always poking through. Um, oh, I'm feeling the the top right quadrant right now. <laughs> it's really, that's amazing. I just yeah, got that. Like, yeah, I have like arrows going both ways because I feel like it enters and then it kind of goes in both directions as yeah. it like pushes around the palette. Yeah. Oh, that's really fun though. But I feel like, yeah, I just got like, I, I almost, am, maybe it's visual reference. But. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I like, yeah, it's not like right or wrong. People are like, what if I draw it incorrectly or whatever? It's like, it doesn't, it's fine. It's all what you perceive too, you know? This is just my perception of it. Yeah. I love it. About it. I love it when it goes together though. We haven't yet done it. We need to do some event where we like have everyone draw. You uh, do, yes. I mean, that could be a Zoom thing too. That would work. That would be awesome. super fun. I think, um, yeah. Also, you have great handwriting, by the way. Thank oh, you. thank you. <laughs> Mine yes. would be illegible. <laughs> it's really hard to read when it's small. I do these on like, what is it? 
17 by 11 pieces of papers and they're that you do them? personally you yeah, do, them? yeah I do them they're on bigger pieces oh. they're not huge but it's basically like two eight and a half by 11 yeah to put together um because these cards are just like almost like four by eights or something yeah they're a little bit longer but yeah they're yeah. like maybe they are four by eight. yeah there's something like that yeah or whatever but i didn't realize they were so big to start with but that does make a lot of sense do you use charcoal yeah. sorry Sorry, do you use charcoal or is it graphite? Uh, I actually wanted to use charcoal when I started because I love doing figure drawing with charcoal. But as I did it and I, I just wanted very clear lines, um, I use more graphite because yeah. the charcoal gets really messy. It does. It can. For sure. Yeah. Especially when I'm drinking wine and <laughs> back. And it's just like one of those things, like if you make yourself focus on what the front top of your palette feels like when the, or where does the wine enter, really focus on where the wine enters and then try to put that in the graphical form. That's basically what I'm doing. A mm -hmm. uh, little bit about the winery now, because we haven't hit on the winery. So this is just up the hill from the historic tasting room. Mm -hmm. uh, into the ground. So most of it is subterranean, the barrel spaces. I'm actually sitting in the glassed area. Um, <laughs> anyway, right now. <laughs> oh, that's you. Like where you are right now. I mean, it's not a video, but here I am. <laughs> uh, I just keep looking at Julie's uh, backdrop because it looks really similar to the to the winery. It's beautiful. Julie, did you get her backdrop? Are yeah, you I see it. It looks similar to the winery. I know it's just really beautiful with the clouds. Yeah. Um, just little pictures of the winery. Yeah. Here we are sorting grapes and destemming them. Yeah. So this is a really important process in the wine, wine making. This is on a harvest day. And then here I am in our tank room doing punch down. So we do kind of harness. Yeah, we wear harnesses on top of the vet. So we don't have like a catwalk where it comes out over the tanks. We actually wear a harness because you have a harness and a and a four by four. And a four by four. <laughs> We, you'll see in the next one. Of, oh, actually, I don't know if I, I think I have the new picture. We actually, yeah, last year after using these stainless steel tanks where I'm doing the punch down for, uh -huh. gosh, so many years, we switched out to more concrete. Mm -hmm. the room is open air. Um, and so the concrete offers such like moderate temperature control of the fermentation mm -hmm. where they don't go crazy. They don't get too hot or too cold. So we ended up switching those out. Um, here they are. These are the new concrete tanks. Nice. So these are, well, are these fermentation vessels or aging vessels? They're red fermentation vessels. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Aging what happens in the barrel room, which we will look at in a sec. So these are actually downstairs, temperature controlled underground next to the barrels. These are our tulips where the veracity part of the veracity was living. And then we also have 100% um, Grenache that we call sensibility that ages like 50% of that wine ages in concrete and the rest is in a neutral large barrel. Yeah. And of course these are all unlined concrete, right? They're all unlined. So it's all like the earth and concrete without any kind of uh, chemicals added. And um, so it's like the wines in contact with that porous concrete, um, which is what I highlight. The minerality. I would love to, um, sorry, I don't mean to, but um, I would love to hear why you had, uh, like what started your obsession with concrete and what you feel like it does. Cause I, I think it's one of those things where it's like, it comes up a lot now and people are really into it. But from your perspective, what? Yeah, I was really intrigued by it when I was up North but I couldn't really figure out how to use it on our wines. We were trying to make, you know these Bordeaux, rich Bordeaux wines. Um, Cause I love oak, let me just say that too. Oak is an amazing. Um, <laughs> addition to winemaking um, when it's used the correct way or it or thought, just thought thought through correctly uh, but so when I moved here I was really trying to um, I knew we were in a warm climate um, really intense climate and I wanted to capture freshness in the wine that was really important for me and for the wines to have great ageability and then I like to say to highlight the gravitas elements in like California we have so much sun and the wines have so much fruit and just to take that wine and throw it into new oak uh, where it works a lot of the time, but sometimes it does, it's just too much and it doesn't show the site. I feel like that'll get in the way of the, 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 the farming and the terroir and the vintage. I love having vintage show its head too. So um, I just started playing around with concrete as a way to highlight other elements besides fruit and power. Mm -hmm. And I started with the, the eggs actually first because these were portable when we were at Denner Vineyards, everything we were had to be able to move around. 
And so I had a couple that were for white for Grenache Blanc and I always had one that was for red and I would compare and contrast the red aged in concrete to that aged in barrel. And what I found is I liked putting our um, lighter reds, light to medium mm -hmm. body red. So the Grenache and the Movedra Grenache blend with some concrete aging. Vintages act differently in concrete. Some do better, some don't do as well. But the bottom line for me is that I built these wines to age. So even if the wine, you're not going to get as much evolution of the wine in concrete. There's not as much oxygen. You don't have the tannin um, from barrels that play a part in that as well. So um, the wine could be in a more like reductive or rustic state. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I'm blending with barrel aged wine. And then you also just give it time in the bottle to evolve. So that's that was part of it too. I wanted to keep the wines fresh and they would age well. Um, um, there's a question here about the concrete eggs and um, whether or not you use the concrete eggs for fermentation as well. And if you do, do you have to punch down or pump over? And, uh, and, and actually about the, what, what's the deal with the egg shape versus the tulip shape too? Yeah, so the, for reds, we ferment in these and then those. So, cause these are about three ton fermenters. They have glycol embedded heated and cooled glycol embedded in the concrete so okay. we because we have this we have this non-temperature controlled room upstairs mm -hmm. and so we just temp, we individually temperature control the ferments but the thing i like about concrete is i don't have to sit there and like turn on the cooling turn on the heat turn on the cooling turn on the heat like you kind of <laughs> have to do with stainless because it loses so much energy to the surroundings it's yeah. a very like sort of even progression and i don't have to tweak it that much so i love that so this is where we do a combination of pump over and punch down um for management of the cap and that is because I'm, I love punch downs, but I don't believe in punching a wine down before it's ready to be punched down. So like forcing a punch down on a fermentation, which isn't caps, not fully formed, mm -hmm. which isn't roaring. So that's why I do pump overs until I can punch down. But then some varieties, some years, I just like to pump over. Yeah. Pump overs to me, the way I do them are more gentle than the punch down ferment, but more nice. less extractive, but it can go both ways depending on the winemaking style. Mm -hmm. And then the eggs will ferment white and then leave the white until we rack it out for bottling. Um, and then the reds go in here after they've been fermented. Like instead of going to barrel, we go to concrete. So you would never, you would never ferment the red wines in a concrete egg? It doesn't have, so you couldn't put grapes in there. Cause it does, some, some people have eggs that have like a door in them. Like the, the, the tulips have this door. Mm -hmm. So you could, if you had something that had a door like that, but those eggs are so tiny. Yeah, they're basically the size of a, a little bit bigger than a large barrel. So they're not very big. Oh yeah, those, oh, I was thinking they were, cause I've seen the bigger ones. Too. There are some big ones and then you can put doors on them and you could ferment in them, but they would need an, a larger opening at the top. They would need, yeah, they, you know, you have to have- and then, Yeah, and then that shape is kind of, uh, I think there's the convection idea, right? Of the egg shape and wow. how it naturally stirs the leaves. Right. So that's like a much bigger topic when you talk about Chardonnay, which a lot of people do Chardonnay and eggs and um, if the wines really don't settle very well in the eggs. So like you, you're getting more of that lees contact with the wine without having to stir it. And that movement. But yeah, that's not necessarily applicable to the thing. Okay. Yes. And I know we're coming up close to our, to our oh, hour. That's okay. I know. I'm sorry. I'm keeping you guys. Oh, just, no, like, you're not keeping them all. I'm keeping you. I want to make sure you can stay oh, long. I'm long. Good. <laughs> I just want to show, I think we're almost there. This is just a picture of one of our barrel rooms that's underground. Um, yeah. More barrels. Yeah. Look at this. And then just the picture of Epic. So I'll stop screen sharing so we can chat okay. longer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's, I think it's, um, yeah, so I, I'm not as familiar with the the tulips you're saying are larger than the, the... Yeah, so they're really just made by different purveyors of concrete. So the eggs were traditionally from this company in France and that's everyone started buying the eggs. And now there's two companies that make them. And then the the tulips are from Italy. They're from the Dolomite region. My husband actually imports those. And oh, fancy. Those are pretty, pretty, pretty popular in France. They're, in a, they're a lot in uh, Bordeaux in some of the amazing uh, wineries like uh, Cheval Blanc has their own style from actually the Italian producer. And then yeah. um, they're actually really popular in Chateau Neuf de Pop as well. Oh. Um, so it was like looking at the wines that were made there and who was using concrete that also, you know, made me want to look into it and try it. Yeah. 
And uh, another quick question, because I do find concrete to be fascinating too. It's not something I'm as familiar with, but I do get the question sometimes where people ask me, and I don't know how to answer it, if different concrete, the way that different oaks can provide different sort of, um, I mean, oak is obviously a flavor profile when they're talking about American oak versus French oak, but yeah. obviously concrete can be made of different products, kind of like different. It so concrete is kind of concrete. Like if you were to run a very controlled trial, um, you would be able to tell the difference in the producers, but they would have to be the same shape, the same wine, you know, at the same, you know, it would be, it's almost, it'd be really hard to do that trial, but I have heard textural differences between Numblo, who makes the X, and the Nico Velo, who makes the tulips. Um, but concrete is more similar. Um, it's more of a size, shape and size, size than different oaks, even Cooper's within the center of France. So I didn't talk about oak that much, but I do mostly like light and medium toast and I'm there for the textural elements, surprise, surprise, that oak gives not so much the like flavor of oak and toast and vanilla, like I'm not looking for those. I'm looking for more build the body with the texture. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, American oak is obviously really different that there are Cooper's almost as different from each other pulling from the same forest in France. Yeah. Yeah, and how they make that and how they toast it for sure. But I was just, yeah, I was I was kind of curious just with your experience, but it sounds like really it's more about size and shape is what you're saying. Than yeah, it is for me totally. I mean, yeah, then you can look at craftsmanship and oh yeah, all those things. But like, it really is it. And I mean, I you know just Europe being Europe, like those vessels, the Numblo or the Nico Velo are like tested to the nines for the purity of the concrete, right? It's like so pure where you, I didn't, so that some of the tanks we have upstairs, like our oldest concrete tanks are actually made by a local uh, concrete tank manufacturer in Paso Robles. He doesn't make wine tanks anymore, but when he did, we hired him to do those for us. Um, so we have American concrete as well. American concrete, yeah. <laughs> Not sure all the testing happens as much, but it's, it's <laughs> I can tell you that it all seems like concrete. Yeah, okay. no, I think it's yeah. so helpful. It's so helpful to know that. And it's, it, it is one of those things where, um, you know, concrete just has that availability. It, it gives you um, an opportunity, something between stainless steel and oak. And it is more about texture than it is about any sort of imparting of flavor and anything like that. Right. You can um, have a copy of my presentation. Yeah. Um, I can, I'll give it to, um, well, Sasha has, um, you have access to it, right? yeah. so she can send it. She can is send that okay? It. Yeah, that's okay. For, I'm totally fine with it because it's oh pictures God. that we've had on we have on our website and stuff too. All of those. So that's fantastic. So yeah, then I can send that out to everyone who joined. I can totally do that. Um, thank you very much for sharing that. Thank you for putting that together. Thank you for these wines. Does anyone have any more questions for Jordan? Because she's amazing. Feel free to unmute and get in here. Yeah, please ask. <laughs> say hello or say thank you or say just ask a question by all means. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> just come visit Epic um, in Paso. It's, I don't know how many of you guys have been up here, but it's uh, yeah. not so far away, right? It's not. And you guys really go taste there, go to the um, go to the tasting room and enjoy the flights together. They do a wonderful job of kind of presenting them and giving you, like she was saying, the opportunity to go through the different, um, to compare the, the, the vineyards with different varietals too. Um, and then, oh, Venkat, thank you. Um, Oh, this is this is a we great. We were talking video. about this. Sasha and I were talking about this actually before you so, guys were on. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, um, the question is, uh, I've heard that Viognier is really hard to find the perfect time to pick because its acid levels drop much faster than most grapes. Mm -hmm. How true is this, Jordan? It's very true. Uh, <laughs> it's really difficult to pick, uh, especially in a warmer climate, because you've got to really stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I do actually, I'm really careful about the Viognier that I put into the white because it, um, I don't want it to be too floral or too, it can kind of get the soapy floral character when it gets too ripe and the pH goes up is exactly what I had told um, Sasha earlier, but we planted Viognier on York Mountain, which I was mentioning, which is a much cooler site and later ripening. And so it's really fun to try the difference of those two wines, um, but then see that the York Mountain Viognier can really stand it low in year after year because it gets that like full ripeness because like, it's not ripening too quickly. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So another question, are you considering giving up your winemaking career to become an artist full-time and sell your impressions? Um, I'm actually trying to do a coffee table book about my impressions. I was, 
working on. I will on, buy it. <laughs> trying to work on that today. The color. So people ask me if I had color and I think they would look beautiful. And I thought initially I might do color, but um, trying to make it a really like honest expression of the texture of the wine. I, I love that some people, some people hear music and wine. Some people see colors. Some people see people and I see lines and texture on my palette. That's how I feel it. Um, so that I'll just keep it true to what I experience. but I totally welcome people to like use that, like it's called synesthesia, right? Using one sense to describe the other sense. So whatever works for you to remember the wine and like to help describe it is. And yeah. And Nancy, Nancy is saying about the, the typical Viennian character not really coming out in the white, which is, yeah, it is really nice, right? Because it's right. be overwhelming, mm -hmm. but the blend is beautiful and it has mm -hmm. such a great kind of complexity. There's still that nice weight to it, but it's so fresh and there's such great minerality to it. And that's, um, yeah, that's the goal, because like even 20, this is a richer wine than the 19 and the 18 were of the white, just because yeah, the year was warmer. But um, having the Grenache Blanc be the lead, I have not on purpose, had Viognier be like one or 2% higher in a couple, one vintage in particular. And I love that wine, but occasionally it's, Viognier is funny because sometimes it's like, here I am. And other times you're like, where'd it go? <laughs> so if it's dominant, it's, you know, sometimes you have that impression of it being so strong. So yeah, it feels like, so even in the yeah, in terms of the ripening and, and like when you pick it, it's also not just about like how kind of heavy it can be, but how intense that kind of profile is, I guess. Um, oh, great. You're going to get some visitors. Oh, yes. 2018. Oh, my gosh. All the 18s are fabulous. And thank you all who want to come visit and for your time today. Um, I would definitely, with the 18s, we have a wine called Block B, which is 100% Syrah from one block on our property, our the Penarevsky Vineyard. So it's like not only vineyard does vineyard specific and varietal specific, but block specific. And that wine is kind of like the most famous flagship wine. But all of the reds, especially the Syrah based reds. I would, I love aging the Grenaches and the Mourvedre Grenache for a long time, but I know the Syrahs will go really long. So we have a couple of Syrahs here if you come taste. Um, we have a Petite Syrah dominant blend. That would be really good for a 20 year Magnum. Oh my gosh. Nice, nice. I like it. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for joining Jordan and welcoming her. And you're so amazing, Jordan. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, can't wait to Okay. See, I mean, see you again. See you here. I know. Bye, guys. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful, Bye. wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.